Right, thank you very much. So it's uh, the title of the conference is the physics of relativistic flows and uh, an observational view. And so uh, well, the first word in the title of my talk is observations. And it's observations of a second kind. So we observe here the result of computer simulations. And uh, it's quite similar. So it's a very complex phenomena which we simulate and uh, you don't know what will happen, so you get the results so, and observe what's going on. So try to figure out what it is, and actually we can use very similar methods for analyzing the data, as you will see. Okay, most of the work was done by my uh, PhD student, who just <coughs> finished his PhD. <coughs> and uh, he also consulted our uh, pews as far as a uh, statistical uh, analysis of uh, the computational data is concerned, and Nico Bicantini uh, is also involved in this work. Okay, so this is a grand view of the Crab Nebula. So what's shown in the green is a thermal emission, uh, which comes from the supernova remnant. And in the blue, we see non-thermal supernova emission. And, uh, well, this part of the nebula is called flare. And uh, uh, it was quite soon I realized that the uh, luminosity of the pleurion is uh, comparable to the spin down power uh, uh, of, the pul of the pulsar, and therefore the power of the pulsar wind. And so the main idea was that well, the pleurion is actually produced by the wind coming from the pulsar, which is uh, the famous car pulse in some way. Okay, and so uh, uh, the kind of accepted model, which some call the model, one of the most successful models in astrophysics, is the MHD model of uh, such pleurions, and it's developed by recent gun, proposed by recent gun first, and uh, uh, significantly developed further by Kedal and Karaniti. So what we have here, and the model is fairly symmetric. Yes, and the wind obviously is well relativistic, and it's an HD model. Um, and it's very systematic, uh, basically for the sake of simplicity, so the problem is constructible. Right, so they knew very well that our uh, winds from the pulses cannot be spherically systematic. The flow has to be uh, axisymmetric at most. Yes, but uh, they use this in simplification, as I say, just for the sake of uh, simplicity, just to get the tractable model. So what you have here is a uh, spherically systematic wind from the pulsar, far away from the pulsar, magnetic field is purely toroidal. And uh, well, this is a uh, supernova remnant, uh, shell, supernova shell. And wind there is a relativistic shell, is non-relativistic, so the wind has to disintegrate, and it disintegrates in this model with the so-called termination shock. So shock which terminates the pulsar wind. And then the shock plasma fills well this uh, bluish region, which is uh, supposed to represent the flare. Right. So if you come back to this well, uh, optical image of the carbon nebula, you already see that well, it's uh, not really uh, spherically symmetric, it's more like axisymmetric, or closet symmetry. Um, um, but the X ray data revealed even stronger deviation from the spherical symmetry. Was the picture which way uh, the X ray observations revealed? is a sort of torus, uh, like a disk-like structure, and a jet. And the axis of the jet and the axis of the torus, so the line gives a major axis of the optical position. Okay, and so, uh, well, the origin of the structure was the subject of debate on fascinated people for quite a long time. And uh, Right, and the theoretical explanation was proposed by in the papers by Lubarsky and Bagavalov uh, and Hangulian. And the main idea is once again that the wind from the pulsar is not actually axisymmetric. Most of the power flows in the equatorial plane, and therefore the ramp pressure of the wind is uh, well more or less described by this law, so it's more or less proportional by the side of the polar square. <coughs> 
So what? The ramp pressure in the equatorial direction is much higher than the ramp pressure in the axial direction. Therefore, the shock must extend much further away in the equatorial plane compared to the polar direction. And uh, this is a well, uh, uh, well, sort of not exact shape, but a, 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 a illustration of this called extended nature of the termination shock of such, a, of such an anisotropic wind. So while well, this line is uh, supposed to represent the uh, streamlines of the wind in the wind, so and then they break at the shock, and they break uh, even further towards the equatorial direction. So most of the plasma is expected to flow in the equatorial plane, and while well, this plasma is represent, represents emission from this plasma, gives you all well, this X-ray torus. Okay. Also, uh, Yuri Libarsky uh, uh, argued that in fact due to the magnetic pinch, uh, due to the hoop stress of the toroidal magnetic field downstream of the termination shock, some of the uh, shock plasma can be redirected towards the axis and then squeezed uh, out in sort of a two-faced effect along the axis, and this will give you the jet. The jet actually spread is not from the pulse itself, but it spread is downstream of the termination shock. As a result of the hoop stress, it's a toroidal magnetic field. And, uh, soon after, uh, there was a number of computer simulations for this problem, and they more or less uh, confirmed. Well, the picture predicted in this uh, newspapers. So basically, you have all this equatorial outflow. Well, this is a, well, it's a pulsar, so the termination shock is somewhat there. So this is the flow downstream of the termination shock, mostly equatorial. You actually see the uh, velocity arrows here on this plot. <coughs> and uh, indeed it looks like, well, an almost disk, an equatorial disk-like flow. And then well, he, it hits, uh, uh, the flow hits the supernova remnant, well, comes back. And he creates a vortex motion, well, and uh, well, here some of the flow is indeed directed towards the axis and squeezed towards the axis. So we get, we get a sort of disk which corresponds to the torus and uh, the jet, which corresponds to the observed jet of the Crab Nebula. And, okay, and here is very uh, synthetic mass, synthetic mass from this uh, outflow and done in a very crude way. But uh, you can immediately see all the things wrong. Even, even so, you can see that there's quite a striking similarity <coughs> of where all the simulated uh, synthetic uh, synchrotron maps with the real maps of the nebula. Right, so a certain degree of success for this model. Okay, <coughs> right, well, that's global structure of the nebula. Uh, but uh, another interesting thing about the periods, about the period of the carb nebula is the existence of a strong variability. It uh, was uh, noticed first quite a long, long time ago, so eight years ago at first, but uh, it was uh, uh, most carefully studied uh, by, I don't know how to pronounce the name. Scargill. 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 Okay. Good. No, no. Uh, Scargill, and he dubbed both his name Wisps. And uh, what are those Wisps? Uh, very thin uh, filament-like structures, like well, this one. This one, this one, <coughs> this one, right? And actually, uh, Scargill, he deduced uh, from the variability, from the observed variability, that those wisps must be moving for relativistic speeds. Right, but for some, uh, <coughs> for some time, there were doubts. And only very recent observations are uh, really confirmed all this prediction. And this is a famous uh, <coughs> movie of the central. That's an optical movie, right? It's an optics, so it's a um, monitoring of the Crab Nebula. Several maps were constructed during a few months period, and now they are shown in a loop. Right? So there's no strict periodicity, right? Periodicity is just because of this. Of this Look in the movie. That's the only, that's the only period. <laughs> right, but 
you can still see that there is the outgoing motion of the wisps, like on the produce somewhere close to the nebula, uh, somewhere close to the pulse, and then move away. And you can see that there was actually lots of wisps. But these are observations, or these are, this is theory? No, this is observation, yeah. This is observation. What, what's the wave band? Wait, what, is it x-rays or? Oh, that's optical. I think this is all just the time scale for the film movie is uh, something like three months. Three months? No, this is a year and a half. No. This is movie, it's less. Well, several months. Right. Oh, no. Um. Okay. So, what about the theory that formation of the wisps, the most developed are, uh, up to now, our theory was proposed by John Arons and his uh, colleagues, one of them is here, in the audience, uh, right there, Anatoly Kutkowski. Mm -hmm. And uh, the explanation is uh, that what we see is actually time-dependent structure of the collision of termination shocks in the presence of ions in the pulse of wind. And uh, yeah, basically, in this model of one radius of the science is comparable to the wisp separation. So this is a very, very thick collision with shock, which we see here. Right. Also, Biagio in 1999 proposed a pure MHD explanation for the wisp. So actually, uh, what we see is the development of the kelvin Hogan's instability in this round fast equatorial outflow in the, in the nebula. Right. Later, when we continue in the zone, uh, criticized basically this result. Uh, they concluded that the time, in the time scale for the growth of Kelvin Kelvin stability is too uh, short, uh, too, too, too large to explain the operation. Right. So basically, there's not enough time for this instability to develop. Okay, but in computer simulations, or well, computer simulations which I cited before, already given some indication of the flow variability, some potential for the risk production. And um, our work here is well focused on this, uh, uh, on this possibility that perhaps it indeed can be explained, this production can be explained by MHD, uh, in the MHD model, and uh, so we've done new simulations with much higher resolution, right? With our improved uh, model of synchrotron emission. And uh, well, another difference compared to the previous simulation is that so we do not impulse equatorial symmetry anymore. So we calculate well, the whole, uh, we do simulation in the whole uh, space, yes. not in the half. Right. Uh, so for those, uh, yeah, the setup basically is the same as uh, our previous paper. Uh, so for those who are not familiar with the setup, well, this is a brief description. So this is a toy model of the pulse wind. So the total energy flux or density is described by this equation. So basically, this is for sine squared theta, which is predicted by the split monopole model of the pulse wind, well, the traditional and isotopy uh, or axial flux parameter, just to make sure that we have some wind flowing in the axial direction as well. Uh, right. Well, that's a new form. This is a, a, the model, a model equation for the magnetic field in the wind. And uh, so if we just ignore all this l uh, last factor, and if xi is 1, then basically all the luminosity, which we see here, is in the pointing flux. Okay? If you introduce well this parameter psi, which is less than 1, which this means that well, in the pointing flux we have less energy than the total energy. So the total energy flux should include <coughs> the kinetic energy flux as well. And while well, this remaining factor um, represents uh, basically the dissipation of the oscillating component of Magnetic field in the stripe wind, this idea which uh, at the termination shock. And uh, well, that's a uh, model which was developed by Yuri Lubarsky as well. Uh, okay. And as I said, well, kinetic energy flux, uh, well, which is kind of this equation, 
uh, by this expression, yeah, it's the difference between the total energy flux and the point of flux. Okay, so R and theta here are spherical coordinates. Yeah, uh, R here is the rest plus density. Gamma is the words factor of the ring. Well, it's 10 on our simulations for technical reasons. And actually, <coughs> as far as the dynamics of the flow in the plane is concerned, it doesn't really matter. As far as highly relativistic, well, in 10 is highly relativistic, if there is no much difference. Well, whether we use 10, 100, 10 or 100, dynamics will still be the same. So, psi is 0.0, well, actually psi squared is 0.16. So most of the flux is in the kinetic, in the form of the kinetic energy. Right, and then uh, let's go further. Right, supernova remnant, uh, well, the simple model, so Hubble uh, law of the velocity. <coughs> um, constant density and the parameters here well basically are fit, uh, fixed to, to fit the expansion rate of the club of the crab nebula okay uh, now the model of synchrotron emission so we assume basically that at the termination shock the power was spectrum or for uh, electrons is produced up to some the maximum energy which is destined to be very high right and this is there power index of the spectrum. And downstream, uh, well, these particles suffer synchrotron and adiabatic losses, and uh, as a result, we have well, this distribution, this distribution function for the, uh, for the electrons. And what is here, and, and not? Well, N is basically an objective tracer. You can think of it as a number density of particles <coughs> that get the flow. Okay, the number density decreases, so we have some expansion. Right? And corresponding adiabatic losses. Okay, so this trace allows us to uh, take into account the adiabatic losses. Okay, and then not here is the initial value of this density as a termination shock. Okay, so basically the ratio of n and not describes you the uh, strength of the adiabatic loss. Okay, and infinity here is the cut of energy. Right, due to synchrotron losses. And uh, on the next slide, here is the equation, sir, on the covariant form, which uh, describes the evolution of the soil tracer density. So you can see that basically what is here, what, what we have here is the conservation of the number of particles in the flow. Right, well, this is an equation, evolution equation for a knot. And uh, according to this equation, n notch does not change. Right? Simply objective without the change. So we always remember on the streamline what was the initial uh, number density of the tracer, the termination shock. Right? And this is a uh, evolution equation for the cutoff energy, infinity, uh, as a result of synchrotron losses, and V prime here is a fluid frame magnetic field. Okay, and assuming that all uh, electrons are, so, so electrons emit at the single frequency corresponding to the energy, well, according to all this uh, very well-known equation, right, we end up with this expression for the uh, synchrotron emissivity, right, uh, so here, B perpendicular is a component of the magnetic field normal to the line of sight, Yes, and D is the top of Okay. Now, computation of grid and the boundary condition, so... <coughs> as I say, we do not introduce uh, equatorial symmetry, we calculate the flow in the whole domain. Right, and we use different resolutions sir, in the future direction well, from 10 to 800 just to see the conversions, at least in the statistical <coughs> properties of a uh, numerical solution. Well, R in, in, the, in the range between well, 0 and 10 light years. 
and the cell size in the other direction is the same as the linear cell size in the hidden direction, so the sort of square, square like cells. Uh, initial wind zone, well, in the initial model, we always have some remnant, yes, at a certain distance, and we think this was well, wind zone. So wind zone extends uh, up to halfway here. <coughs> and the initial remnant zone extends from half light year to ten light years. So in fact, the remnant should be much thinner, but uh, because we are not really interested in the interaction of the shell with the external medium, right, we can uh, extrapolate the shell solution up to the outer boundary of the domain. For us, it doesn't matter. Right. Right, and the duration of the run, so basically it corresponds to the age of the curve nebula. So boundary conditions, right? So here is 2D. We do 2D simulations with the axial symmetry. Well, it's it equals zero y, obviously. And we have radiative boundary at the result age of the computation which is 10 light years. Okay, and uh, what is shown here is a, a snapshot of a total pressure distribution right in the solution near to the end of the run. So solution which corresponds to the current age of the carnival. Yes, and uh, for the highest resolution which we, which we use. You can see immediately that uh, this is very complex, very you can guess that this is a very dynamic uh, structure. So this is a termination shock. It doesn't have all this nice uh, symmetric shape as in the previous simulations. So here, uh, downstream determination shock, you can see uh, well, other shocks, or weaker shocks, probably propagating in the developments. Well, you'll see it later. And uh, well, those are islands of low pressure basically correspond to vortices. Yeah, and those vortices are emitted from the termination shock. And here we have a axial, well, very high uh, pressure regions near the axis due to the stress of the magnetic field. We have very strong comp axial compression. All right. Okay, in fact, this is a, uh, what I've got here is a, an animation. So if I press it now, it should start. Yeah. Okay, so what do we see now? Just so we can see the termination shock changes shape all the time. So it's, it's very dynamic, very unsteady, contracts, expands, moves a little bit downwards, a little bit upwards. The equatorial symmetry is completely broken. Right? Uh, outside, well you can see propagating shocks from uh, from the termination shock. Yes, they move outwards, some of them in fact uh, move inwards, you know, like here. And uh, well, this is a very active region along the axis. Well, we have our unsteady compression, our refraction here, compression, the refraction. Is, is the equation state uh, always relativistic? Yeah. It's so, uh, so, so that's why you get the, the, re the recurring rarefactions and compressions. Because otherwise the termination shock would slow it down to non relativistic speed. If we're non relativistic equations, then from non relativistic equations. Yeah. So these are electrons and pocket and pocket drops. So I'm not sure. I think if I use gamma phi field, I would still see the very, very much similar behavior. But okay. We can discuss it later. Right. So have you seen enough of this? <laughs> Is this not coming here? No, it's a. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's a, it's a close to the very end. Maybe <coughs> the last uh, 40, 80 years. I don't remember exactly. All right, and it's shown in the in the loop as well. So. But that's a very long. One. Is this light years what we see? In this yes, case? what we see here is the light years. Yes, so it's a one, two, three light years. So basically, in the termination shock, or the size of the termination shock is about one light year. What's the maximum bulk of the rest factor that you get? Uh, in the 
downstream of temperature charge, of course. Well, it uh, can be up to 0.9 the speed of light. So the yeah. loss itself, yes. Oh, five minutes already? Okay, yeah. Okay, so this is another uh, movie. Uh, what it shows, it shows uh, uh, magnetic field. So, magnetic field is toroidal, yes, but uh, its sign, its direction changes in the wind. So, it's uh, uh, clockwise uh, in the upper hemisphere and anticlockwise in the lower hemisphere, as, as expected in the speed model. Okay, uh, right. So, Buff blue and red color corresponds to the regions where you have strong magnetic field and uh, uh, sort of yellowish color corresponds to the region where you don't have. The uh, magnetic field is quite weak. Yes, and it, the units actually in Gauss here. Okay, and this is again a more uh, sim uh, animation. So now you can clearly see uh, the flow. Right, so that's our flow downstream of the termination shock close to the uh, uh, close to the axis, right? and then it proceeds, uh, and it's mostly up, uh, outwards motion yes. in this region. But also you can see some of motions towards the uh, towards the towards the back towards the center, and particularly here it's very noticeable. Yeah, so some part of the flow redirected back to the axis and then it's squeezed along the axis in the polar direction. Once again, there's no equatorial symmetry and there is now actually clear equatorial disk. Right? So that in this sense, well, this solution, this high resolution a solution without equatorial symmetry destroys the disk completely. We don't have it anymore. It's qualitatively different behavior compared to the previous simulations. Right, uh, let's move forward. So this is a uh, synthetic synchrotron map, a you know, snapshot <coughs> at some point, and uh, what we see here are well, a number of wisps, some of them quite bright, but if you, if you have a good eyesight, you'll see lots of lots of finer wisps as well. So it's very fibrous, very delicate, fine structure. Yeah, can you see? Okay, well, if you don't, well, actually, actually it's much better on my, uh, on my screen <laughs> than here. So if you want to see it later, I will show you. Uh, right, there also as well some uh, bright feature, highly variable feature at the base of the jet, right, which is probably corresponds to what has the dot as bright. Okay, that's uh, one. Okay, <coughs> another animation. Well, now we can see the dynamics of the wisps. And um, once again, it's much better here. Um, right, but anyway, you'll see that wisps are, wisps are constantly reduced, and uh, uh, the predominant motion is expansion. But you also can see a contraction from time to time. Right, well, let's move on because I um, run out of time. Okay, so let's go back. Um, so in this, in this slide, I, I want to explain the statistical analysis of the data. Okay, so we observe all this uh, dynamics and then uh, the question is, sir, uh, what is this uh, statistical property? What is the characteristic time scale for the variability and how it depends on the resolution? Yes, and here, what we have, we have time series which uh, mm. shows how emissivity at a particular point well, very close to the termination shock and close to the equator. Yes, so how it varies in time for different resolutions, 100, 200, 400, 300 cells. You can clearly see that there is a change. Right? Well, what all the uh, sharp uh, spikes and crystals <coughs> of the wisps crossing the cell? Right, and you can see that well, here a few wisps and uh, they're sort of very, very spread in time. Uh, very thick wisps uh, are getting thinner, and molds them, thinner, and molds them, and they're uh, well, probably on this plot 
And on this plot, we have more or less all the same statistical properties. But uh, <coughs> to, to check this, we need to do some prop analysis. And uh, we, what we've done here, we uh, constructed a correlation function for uh, those time series. And you can see all the differences. So once again, 100, 200, 400, 800 cells. And uh, OK, so what, what's uh, here? Oh, yeah, uh -huh. So what's here is a uh, uh, log tan of the, uh, well, delta t basically, of the time lag in the correlation function in years. OK, so 0 corresponds to 1 year. Okay. Can you see 0 here? Yeah. Okay. Right. So, where do you have a plate or, well, well, the time scale which corresponds to the whole transition from the power of the uh, plateau, 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 I don't know how to pronounce it. Okay. Right, so that's the characteristic time scale of uh, the variability of the large scale variability. Okay. Now, as far as this is power law, power laws will correspond to some noise. Right. You see, well, here probably there is one uh, power law. Yeah, right. and as far as well, well this are uh, the characteristic scale. Because, well, here it's about uh, longer than one year. It's a little bit longer than one year. Here it's a little bit shorter than one year. Here it's uh, the transition to the point is about one year. It's about one year. So, fine. It looks like, well, as far as our large scale variability is concerned, we have conversion. Okay, now power law corresponds to some noise. And uh, you can see that well here, 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 and there, we have the same slope. And actually, what you see here is a numerical noise. Numerical noise in the data. But we also see a second power law emerging uh, for this resolution. And it's clearly visible here, and, uh, and uh, occupies a lot longer range in the uh, lot time. And this corresponds to the turbulence generated by the large scale model. Okay, and there is no uh, uh, quasi periodic uh, behavior at the large time scale. So it's uh, on the large time, on the large scales, when we have the chaotic process. Right. Uh, conclusions. Okay, so it's new high resolution uh, t symmetric energy simulations, a real well, highly unsteady flow in the pulse of nebula. Right, synthetic maps uh, display all fine fiber structure, actually very close to what, uh, in, well, gravitatively at least, to what is seen in the crab nebula, and relativistically moving wisps, we also see them, and uh, they propagate at similar speed uh, to what is seen in the crab nebula. The predominant motion is of expansion, for uh, contraction is also seen right every time. And the characteristic time scale of the flow of variability wisp production is around one year. Yes. And we see also some indication of a strong MHD tolerance in this election. Okay. Thank you very We have time for a few questions. Is, is there a simple scaling argument? What's, what is there happening at one year? Is there a crossing time? Yeah, well, the simplest one, isn't it? Well, we take the size of the stimulation shown divided by the speed of light. You get one year. That's probably not what it is. <laughs> so um, the structures produced by stimulation shock, well, sort of variable structures. You can see well, their length scale is a bit short. And actually their speed over uh, sound waves, fast MHD waves, is also short. So this is probably why we get something like close to one year. But otherwise, otherwise I can't tell anymore. You mentioned earlier that the theoretical suggestion that the separation between the wisps is the, the larmor radius of the proton. Yes. Is this what you see in the simulation? No, no, no. It's pure MHD. Hmm? It's pure MHD. The simulations are pure MHD simulations. Yes. So there is no any kinetics. Okay. So those wisps, uh, they correspond to the well, those perturbations. You yeah, create it well near the termination shock, and then they propagate downstream with the flow, 
and it's mostly this is what the CS means. <coughs> right? So what determines the what the separation? Probably the same question that has. Well, uh, as I said, well, there is no clear, there is no clear physical argument as to what determines the separation. As well, most I can say that well, this is one layer size determination shock, but uh, the perturbation it, it produces a smaller scale. So therefore, it's a few times smaller separation between disks, right? With few times smaller the size of the termination shock. So it's a termination shock which determines so the size of the termination shock, which basically determines the separation between bright disks. But also, we have very very fine disks as well. The separation between them is much shorter, and that corresponds to the smaller scales that are also there present in the model. The present in the solution, much smaller scale. So, so it seems there is some basic instability there. Do you know, understand theoretically what's the sort of instability which is driving yes. the, the whole process? Yes, the, the problem is that um, it's. Um, why, could, why, why could argue that probably it's uh, something like uh, uh, Helm Kelvin Helm Helmgold's instability initially? It could be. Because we, we clearly see a share, we clearly have a share flow, right? Then also we can have something like a sassy instability here, right? The other way around. It's not an accretion shock, it's a termination shock. But uh, there will be reflections of uh, waves from the uh, supernova in the back into the cavity, into the plerial, right? Which will interact with the termination shock. So the process could be quite similar to sassy. Do you have this in your simulation? I mean, in your simulation, are far enough to get to the termination? Yes, 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 to, to the remnant, yeah. To the so boundary the between the player and the remnant. The yes, 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 yes. But actually what we see here, we see highly nonlinear phase stage already. And in this stage, it's not possible actually to say what actually cost all this large scale of so It's It's already nonlinear. It's like chicken, chicken and, and, and egg probably. You can't tell what comes first. Is it either well, you can say this is a large scale perturbations in the nebula, which come back, sort of hit the, the determination shock and make the determination shock to change the shape, right? But the change shape of the determination shock creates new perturbations, right? Strong perturbations which propagate downstream. And now it's all well, locked in nonlinear fashion. No, I, I completely agree that at this stage you just see something, but I'm trying to see. Uh, if you, you could try, for example, to change the conditions, like the, you can change the boundary condition. Uh, if you and see if this changes in how this changes in the boundary condition, I mean, the, the, how do they influence this? And this one can try. Oh, yes, well, uh, I have to do something dramatic, like well, get rid of a uh, supernova shell, for example. <laughs> yes, in this case, well, I don't know. I might not get the termination shock, <coughs> or. Or it should make well, the supernova shell very light, so it's pushed away, but not the highly relativistic. <coughs> so you still have some termination shock, but it will propagate, the size will increase quite fast. So we haven't done those kind of experiments. No. Anyway, it's fantastic. But we, we, try, we try to be as well realistic as possible. Anyway, this, the is, this is a really fantastic simulation. I want to Thank you. Okay, let's thank Sergei again. <laughs> and the next speaker is uh, Stefan Fauvel, and he's going to talk about relativistic jets. Talk about relativistic jets in the creating stellar mass black holes. Okay. Okay, so first, thanks for the invitation. Uh, I think I will be one of the rare to talk about galactic system in the meeting, but I will try to present a review of what we know on these galactic uh, system. 
Okay. Does you want to change slide also? Okay. So, first I would like to mention, I mean, I will present some new results from my student, uh, Michael Coria. And also I mentioned some of my collaborators, but I have not listened to all of them. This is a part of the work, but of, done, of work done by a lot of people. But also some other people not, uh, uh, not working in collaboration with them. So, okay, so basically my, the, my talk will be divided in different parts. So as most of you are not maybe familiar with the uh, binary system in our galaxy, I will present an introduction, and then I will, uh, I think, uh, spend a significant time on the black hole jet in the hard state, with associated with the set of sort of that jet. I think well, that's something uh, that came the recent, in the last decade. I will present also some information on the state transition and on the tra what we are, we are more familiar maybe with the transient jet or the superluminal jet and event. And also I will mention a recent paper uh, that appeared, I think, a few weeks ago in Nature on, uh, on wind in the soft state. Uh, and if I have time, I will discuss a little bit on jet environment. And at the end, I will, open, uh, I will have a few open questions. And I think uh, that may be uh, interesting for the next year. OK. So, there is a clear, I mean, uh, direct link between, I mean, X-ray binary and uh, AGN. So, I mean, you have the same ingredient. I mean, you have the accretion disk in both systems. You have a, uh, now, I mean, jet that are obvious in, uh, in most of these systems. And, of course, uh, the way the, the accretion disk is feeding is, is, is a bit different, but at least that's from the external part, part in the inner part, it should be a bit too different. So we have uh, multiple objects, and of course, because we have multiple objects, we have emission from a lot of uh, different components. So let's take the, the case of the uh, X-ray binary. So you have the companion star, so which illuminate in optical, UV, infrared. You have the accretion flow in optical, UV, and then accretion disk, uh, you go from optical infrared down to X soft X-rays for the inner part of the accretion disk, so this will depend on the temperature of the inner part of the disk. And also here you have a, a corona, I mean that is a uh, optical steam corona in the stock, what are called the standard model. Uh, that is as origin of uh, non-thermal non -thermal or thermal uh, power law. And uh, now, I mean, you also have jet that emit from radio millimeter infrared and also possibly uh, possibly at high energy. So I think there is a lot of debate about the nature of this corona uh, and also on the link of this corona with the base of the jet. So <coughs> that's something I will address later. But just of course, I mean, you, can, you have a lot of different physics uh, components, but for that you need, I mean, relative wavelength observation in order to distribute the in order to gain information on these processes that evolve, I mean, uh, quickly. So, okay. So basically, I mean, we are, we are here dealing with accretion and ejection processes. Here the, ah. no, no, no. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. In the jet system, I mean, so we are mostly dealing with non-thermal processes and particular acceleration, accretion disk, I mean, thermal processes, I mean, general relativity. I will not address this, but if you want, I mean, you can study the lines, um, then you can get information on what's happened very close to the black hole. And I think that's something that is, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, result coming on this aspect. <coughs> so if you compare, I mean, uh, stellar mass black hole, uh, super, uh, supermassive black hole in HEA, so of course you have a uh, different scale in terms of mass. And of course, if you want, you can add to intermediate mass black hole, and if you believe that there are intermediate mass black hole, but I don't think the question is solved, and Monfred is going to talk about that later. And you can, 
do physical different scales, I mentioned the mass, but also the accretion rate is varying significantly for one system from, if you go from creation up to order, you can have a change uh, up to the, uh, like of the order 10 to the 6. The geometry also can change when you have the question you have accretion rate that evolves. And there are many open questions regarding the jets, of course, formation, composition, alimentation, where does the energy come from? Uh, what is the fraction of accretion power that go in the jet? So I think we start to get some information now. And of course, because you have different population of uh, black hole, I mean, or in terms of mass, but also in terms of accretion rate, or in terms of even of scaling frequency. So can you try to derive some scaling laws between various parameters in order to make some prediction for the different population of black holes? And of course, you can also use uh, jet uh, at some point are going to impact the environment. So you can try to gain information from what you, are, what you observe in the environment in order to deduce information on the composition, but energy budget of the jet. Okay. So let me first present a unified model of uh, typical outburst. So here you have typical outburst. I think that this one was, uh, I think one uh, trip in minus four, which is now a sort of Rosetta stone for X-ray binary, uh, binary. I think is there is some important result with. with in this, in this sources. So you have typical time scale of one year. From here you have uh, all sky monitor, XT, uh, light curve, so from the from this the time scale of one year. So here you have a weak weak emission and then you have a, a stronger emission. So the crab level is about here. Here this is high for crab, just to have an, an idea. So basically you can make you can distinguish two states. I will not enter into detail, but there is a lot of <coughs> detail. Basically, there is a hard state where you have a, a X-ray spectrum is dominated by a non-thermal power law or thermal power law with a cutoff sometimes. And in the soft state, you are strongly dominated by uh, a soft thermal component from the inner part of the equation list, typically about one kV. So this is a way to distinguish between these states, but you are also a lot of change in timing property, but I'm not going to enter this detail. And on the way to the transition from the hard state to the soft state, you have an intermediate combination. But I will, that's enough for the moment. So another important uh, difference is radiation efficiency. So in the soft state, I mean, you are uh, all printed uh, energy is radiated, so uh, in the inner part of the disk, so you have efficient accretion. And this coupling is also expected for neutron star because you have a surface, so all energy will be radiated. But when you are in the hard state, so you are in an inefficient uh, regime, so you are not radiating all the energy. So you have many way to be inefficient, one way to affect energy to the event or result of the black hole, but another way is for the hole to extract it and to put it in the jet, and that's another way to be also inefficient, at least uh, in terms of radiation. So, what about in terms of jet? So we have also a classification of the jet properties. So, I think in the, in the 90s, the work done by Felix Mirabel, uh, Bob Kielming, was uh, the superluminal ejection event, that's a microquasar jet with ejection close to the period of line and similar to AGN. When this one now are observed on the transition from the hard state to the soft state. So this is called, what Rob has called the jet line. So this is, uh, I think that's uh, pretty clear. But what is new in the, in the, in the picture is the compact jet. This is self-absorbed compact jet that you observe only in the hard state, when you, when you are in an inefficient regime. 
So this is uh, this is what I call a compact jet. That is something that has come from the late 90s, early uh, 2000. So you have it here, and then here you will destroy it here, and then you you form them again when you go back to the hard state. So this is basically, I mean, the the picture in terms of uh, unified model of uh, jet production. So you have two forms of jet. So you have the compact jet and the, for the hard set and the discrete ejection event. So let's now go in more detail. Uh, so there is many uh, properties, but I will not discuss them here. But if you want, I mean, this is a plot we have produced with, uh, with uh, some people. And where this is a lot the general property we agree. And so if you want, I mean, you can you can grab this plot from this, uh, from this uh, reference. I mean, if I will provide you later if you want. Okay, let's now focus on the hard state. Uh, so hard state, I mentioned, it's characteristic by a, a compact jet. So what is a compact jet? It's a flat, so you have an image here from sinus from sinus x1, uh, hard state, done by steering attack. So the typical scale is milliard second or uh, tens of astronomical units. So it's very difficult to resolve them. So there is a factor of 1,000 compared to the superluminous infection event, the discrete set. So this is flat spectrum, they are weak. So I mean flat or inverted, the spectrum is slightly rising up to, uh, from radio up to, uh, up to uh, infrared. I will come back here for the infrared later. They are observed in all hard cells. There are a few exceptions, but any time you observe a black hole in the hard cell, you have this kind of weak radio emission with particular spectrum. Uh, so there is a question about the contribution at higher energy. Uh, I will address a bit this question here, uh, but not as been done by Sarah Markov. Uh, and collaborators by doing some spectral energy modeling. Uh, modeling. I will address it by uh, looking at correlation between different wavelengths. I will first discuss between radio and X-ray, and also I will then discuss about infrared and uh, X-ray. So the idea is to try to get some predictive scaling law between uh, by doing some correlation of simultaneous observation, of course. <coughs> so this is the origi original work that was done uh, a few years ago. This is the first one for 3 minus 4. So you, you can see we, uh, this is radio flux density versus uh, X-ray flux. So radio emission comes from the jet, and X-ray comes from, I would say, corona, or uh, at least something that is at the base of the jet. So you can see there is a strong I mean, correlation, non-linear coupling. And so this is the original work. Uh, and this is a work done by Elena Gallo, uh, where you have, in fact, the blue point are this point. And she has added, I mean, another black hole, PO4 Sydney. And there is few other recurrent points, but so. And so there's, at, at this point, I mean, this work was, uh, so the idea was, X-ray could be synchrotron, direct optical sync synchrotron from the jet. Or there is also alternative uh, interpretation like ADAF or flare from a magnetic corona. So uh, the idea of universal correlation, but you can see there is some dispersion. But this sample is dominated by the two sources, between the minus 4 and the 4 sigma. So I have uh, okay, I just want to mention here. This was at the origin of maybe what you know. Uh, it's a fundamental claim, so which is basically before we have radio X-ray, but if you add a scaling term to take into account the mass of the of the black hole, so you can have a three-dimensional uh, well plane if you do a projection. But uh, so and then you can have, for example, this is two versions done by Meloni and Matteo. So this is work done by Falco, Kerbing, and Markov, 
And so this is no correction in mass, but if you do correction in mass, so basically you obtain also the supermassive black hole, uh, also lying on an extrapolation of the of the galactic uh, radio X-ray correlation. Uh, so M. R. Curling has done uh, has improved this work by looking at the at, at the sample of doing a more precise field. So I think there is a um, the link is stronger with the log luminosity SLS and the R cell black hole. I think that's one of the conclusions. However, this relies strongly of the binary sample. And there is a strong difference between the binary sample here. And so I have re refined the correlation in, in this x ray binary. For example, for compared to Elena Gallo, so the sample has increased significantly when I have observation down to quasons. So there is a very strong correlation. And for 339 minus 4, this is some uh, new data, and I, I have some more, even more observation. So basically, there is some refining, but I will not enter into detail. But uh, basically, I mean, there is still a strong correlation, but it's closer to 0.6 here. So there is also two tracks for 339 minus 4. It's very, uh, so the tracks are indicative of the rise of the decay of the black hole, but it's more complicated than that. But basically, there is two parallel tracks and, uh, in, in radio. This is also in infrared for other sources, but uh, not in infrared for this one. It's quite interesting. So, um, point six, I mean, that will be consistent with uh, synchrotron self Compton uh, emission from the, from the jet. I will come back later to that. Okay, so now I mentioned. Uh, correlation between uh, radio and X-ray. So, but if we have a, a flat spectrum from the radio up to infrared, why not using the infrared to, cor to correlate with, uh, with X-ray? Because it's easier to make infrared observation than radio observation, especially for source in the southern hemisphere. So, because we know that when the jet is becoming uh, particularly seen, this is related to the location of the base of the jet. This will happen uh, in uh, infrared. Uh, just for example, in AGN, it's happened roughly millimeter. So if you just do scaling, scaling, uh, scaling low, you will expect to have it in infrared. And in fact, that's where we, we found it in, uh, for example, Swiss Finan Manus 4, two years ago. So we have a break on that and we confirm with other sources. So the break is roughly here, around mid uh, near infrared. So then we can use the infrared to probe jet emission. So, and uh, Dave Russell, I mean, has has done a uh, very good compilation of uh, all uh, simultaneous measurement of uh, black hole in the hard state. So, and found a very strong correlation. So. Uh, my student has done a work on Trifina Manus 4, the same stuff as before. Here there is more than 700 observations uh, <coughs> simultaneous with, uh, between X-ray and on, 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 uh, on, um, so with X-ray. So this is along the five years, five years. There is uh, four outbursts of the source. So you can see that there is a two tracks, one for the hard state and one for the soft state. And so you have a few decades. So here, when you are in the hard state, you are correlating jet emission with corona emission for the X-ray. When you are in the soft state, you are correlating uh, infrared here. You are correlating the emission from the external part of the equation disk with the emission from the inner part of the operation disk. So, and we can do some SOD for the point when <coughs> we are in the hard state. So you, have, you can recognize, I mean, uh, what I mentioned, the cutoff here. So, and you have the disk spectrum. And when we are in the soft state, so we can, we have clearly, I mean, on the rising trend of the multicolor disk that we need. So, and, 
So I will not talk about uh, the soft state. That is not <coughs> so interesting at the moment. So, but what you see here, so you clearly see means there is the same correlation for all outbursts. And so even you don't see uh, you don't see the history of this here, but so you see a strong correlation. When you see a deviation at low flux at about 10 to minus 4 in turn luminosity. How can we explain this uh, this behavior? So just now we focus on this branch. So we focus too on the on the hard state. <coughs> so here you have the correlation index. So this is the value measure. And so this is at low flux. So you have a very strong correlation. So even if you have four outbursts, four different outbursts with period of quite of place on in between, so you observe, I mean, the, exactly the same coupling. So I have no time to address the question of hysteresis, but uh, that's, that's something else. And also there is a deviation at low flux. So, <coughs> What can we, how can we explain, I mean, this different uh, correlation index? So, let's assume that the corona and is the base of the chain. So, <coughs> and assume that the inverse Compton component that is supposed to arise from the corona is due to subproton self Compton. Then, uh, if you take any argument, I mean, you will expect so x y luminosity to scale with the power of the jet with this number, 11 uh, fourths. And if you take any jet model, I mean, you will expect the monochromatic luminosity of the jet to scale as z power, and then you have the spectral index, uh, the jet, compact jet spectral index that, that we enter here. So if you take the infrared in H-band, so you, what we see is what you will expect. Uh, for as a dependency. I mentioned here, when you are in the compact jet, so you have a slightly rising uh, spectrum. So this is typically what we observe. And when we have an optical in case, so this is, uh, this is what we have. So if you enter the two index, so you want, this is what you expect, uh, B equals 0 0.48 and B equals 0 0.66. And <coughs> unfortunately, it's exactly the number we have, but, uh, not done on purpose, but so basically, I mean, we can what we believe we observe here. So when you are in a high luminosity, so you have the H band that lies on the flat spectrum. But this great frequency is expected to decrease with a mass accretion rate. There is an independency, and so you will expect to have this to. to, to to diminish uh, to, to the lower with with uh, mass accretion rate. So and then you expect to be here at lower uh, on the optical thin branch when when, uh, when you observe later. So so you have an idea. You can have an estimate of the bright frequency. And so this will favor a synchrotron self compton as the origin of uh, hard X-ray emission of black hole in the hard state. So this is consistent with SOD modeling. Alternative, so you could be have, you can you could also have an adapt type solution here, and then here you switch to a, a contribution dominated by branch halo from the resi residual flow. That's also possible. Okay. Well, okay. Uh, I'm not okay. Well, uh, okay. I don't so I can skip that. But so basically, I mean, you have. Uh, Correlation down to Poisson 8 order of magnitude if you scale all black hole. So, but okay, I have no time to talk about this relatively efficient black hole in the hard state, but that's uh, something else. I, I want to, to switch to the, to the state transition. So, as I mentioned, when you enter the state, the soft state, you have a strong quenching of the compact jet. You don't have any more the compact jet, but you have uh, you have some discrete ejection event. So this is, I mean, what mentioned here. I want to mention here a recent paper by uh, Nielsen and Lee. 
I was in nature a few weeks ago. This is uh, observation, chamber uh, high resolution observation of GRS 1915, which is uh, one, one of the few superluminal sources. They have like uh, 10 to 30, 30 uh, 11 observations with Chandra at different periods. So they have some taken at hard flux, uh, uh, at low flux, on high flux. So some are dominated by hard components. So basically, if you take the source that has the hard state, so you have a faint and broad emission line in the, hard, in the faint hard state. But if you go to the soft, the bright soft state, this is what they have. They have narrow absorption line in the bright, uh, in the bright soft state also, but with also the uh, outflowing, uh, with a, um, with a blue shifted line. So, basically, I mean, the broad absorption line, they are created by the elimination of the interaction disk by the hard x ray the source of hard x ray And the narrow lines here are produced by accretion disk wind that are powered by radiation pressure but also thermal pressure. So, but the interesting the interesting uh, aspect is that the winds drive roughly the same mass loss as the as the jet, as the compact jet. So when you are hard state, you have some <coughs> power in the jet, but you find the same power when you, in the wind when you are in the softer state. So the conclusion by uh, Nielsen and Lee was that you have a, a competition between quantization. Comp uh, and photoionization. So this is that mediate, I mean, the coupling between the jet and the disk in 1915. So when you, when the disk is uh, approaching, or at least when you have a stronger soft component, so you are suppressing the quantonizing flux, and then you photonize uh, and, and produce, I mean, uh, a wind that will uh, quench the jet that you observe. Uh, jet environment, I have uh, here for a few minutes. Uh, basic picture I want to show is jet do produce high uh, relativistic particles. So this is an example of X-ray directly resolved with Chandra for a galactic system. Uh, this spectral energy distribution consistent with a synchrotron. So this jet produce high energy particles when they inter interact with the uh, interstellar medium. So, and then you have synchrotron emission, you have TV, TV electrons that are accelerated. So, but, uh, Cygnus 6.1, I think uh, Manfred is going to talk about that, so I can escape it. Wait. So, I can escape it. And I want to spend the remaining two minutes I have talk about uh, two things. <coughs> One is about the possible magic detection of uh, Cygnus 6 one So, as you know, uh, magic, I think it was in 2006, 2007, 2006, right, has reported uh, a flare by Cygnus 6 one So, Cygnus 6 one is a typical macroquasar that is most of the time in the hard state with a compact jet. So uh, only different is as a high mass companion, so this is why it is, why it, uh, why it is persistent. So magic are detecting a one day flare uh, during, they have called a, a three day X-ray flare. Well, for me it's not really an X-ray flare because the source, I mean, is varying, I mean, it's not like a flare, it's not a really outbursting, but the fact is they have the claim a detection. It's not a strong one, it's four to five sigma, it depends on the count it, but they have a detection at, 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 but as, um, at a consistent with the position of sigma six one. But what is also interesting is the detection is close uh, the space to where you have a maximum uh, gamma gamma at, uh, absorption. So it means that you the emission zone will have to be at this uh, at, at certain distance from the black hole. So, of course, the basic interesting side for that 
is uh, the jet of the black hole. So, for example, Guillaume Dubus here has presented, for example, a, a typical, I mean, spectrum uh, for, 19, uh, for, no, for sinus X1 in the hard state. So, this is a reported detection by magic. And here you can have the, you have the sensitivity level of Fermi. So, the one day, one month, one year. So, if this kind of flare happen, so that's very interesting for Fermi because Fermi, as you will hear today, uh, tonight, uh, is I mean, observing the sky all, all the time. So, on the galactic plane every three hours. So, it's, this should be important in the, in the future. Another thing is a microquasar, microblazer. And I think we, we have one already in the galaxy. <coughs> uh, this is work done by Rob Fender. So you have different maps. So you have three epochs, uh, three dates, October, May, December. On here, you have uh, different observations. So c 61 is a neutron star binary with outbursts every 16 days. So you have an X-ray flare. On here, you can see there is two zones, what is called A and B. So you have a flare in the core, and then B is flaring, and then uh, B, no, A is flaring, and then B is flaring. And so you can get an ID. Uh, you have a, a 15 meter second uh, per day. And so what you have here, you have a weakly relativistic radio emitted node, which are energized by an unseen ultra relativistic uh, with a Lorentz factor of more than 15, outflow flowing its flare. I think this is the fastest X-ray, uh, not X-ray, well, it's X-ray jet also now, but it's a uh, faster jet in, our, in, uh, in, uh, in the galaxy. And what is interesting is the jet is inclined to the line of sight with an angle of 5 degrees. So it's very close to the observer. And interesting, this source in the 70s was extremely bright. It was uh, more than Jensky level. So now it's about a few Jensky. So, so it's, it, you may have a jet, a, a precession of the jet, and the jet, if you jet, uh, something is missing here. If the jet is close to the line of sight, so you, have, you may have the analog of laser in the galaxy. And that would be a thing interesting for, for, for Fermi. <coughs> so my conclusion. So you have in the hard state, so we have a powerful compact jet. So the correlations are interesting on to, to produce scaling now as a diagnostic of emission processes. <coughs> so this seems to favor synchrotron type Compton as a regime of emission in hard X-rays. So that this provides other information that I have not addressed here, but that's also important. In the soft state, this jet could be suppressed by the wind of the equation disk. And something that I have not addressed, but a little bit too fast, maybe, but is that when you have state mode transition, so the discrete electron event later interact with the ISM, intermediate. This could be on time scale of years, but could also be on time scale of months. And then you have particle wave acceleration and produce X-ray set on high energy particle. So I think otherwise, I mean, Fermi would be important to study the high energy dimension from relativity jet associated with uh, this kind of study. <coughs> Thank you very much. We have time for a few questions. Yes. So at the beginning, you mentioned that the general picture is that the soft state is the high accretion period, and the hard state is a low accretion period. Yes. And but looking at some of your plots, we saw that the hard state and soft state exist for exactly the same X-ray luminosity. Yep. And so how it can be? Well, because you... I just don't understand, because the standard feature is that the soft state um, close to the Lincoln rate, and then you change to some uh, inefficient accretion rate, so low accretion, I mean, uh, low accretion rate, so the, the total luminosity should be lower, no? And no, it depends, no. The, if you... If you, uh, let's see, can you have, uh, uh, no, I have no hardness intensity diagram, but, uh, I see, this is a turtle head, I have, uh, but basically, I mean, you can, no, you, you can, even if the equation rate, yeah, 
Okay, e even if the equation weight, I mean, uh, change, I mean, you you have a transition at a constant luminosity. I mean, that I mean, that's something. Uh, uh, it depends how you where you um, how you carry uh, your energy. I mean, so you here most of the energy is not radiated, but here you go. Uh, Transition here, you have here you are about ten percent in internal luminosity. Here you are about two two percent, but uh, so obviously it's impossible. Hmm? Obviously it's impossible. Two. That's energetically impossible. If you have the same <coughs> luminosity in one case, you have an uh, in, in, uh, inefficient, in another case you have efficient. Yeah, that's impossible. Why, why is it impossible? But energetically, it's just impossible. You have the same output. Yeah. What, what they define as accretion is, is really the relative efficiency of the <coughs> So, I mean, here it's mechanical and here it's radiated. So, you have to increase the luminosity to go from the soft to the hot state. That's something. What? Yeah, I mean, if you, pr you, if you want to produce the same luminosity output. Here, you are, for example, here you have some, there, I have only plotted the point. There is here some point, I mean, at close to Eddington luminosity at higher. If you go to what I would call the steep overload state, very high state, you can reach, I mean, uh, much higher factor here. So, but here you have only up to the transition. So here you don't have, I mean, point up to the steep overload state. I mean, you you can clearly reach. Uh, it depends how you follow up. If you have, you can observe. If you spectrum, it depends where you measure your energy. I mean, you are not. Uh, it's not the should be I mean, you know. But here it's only uh, three, three nine. It's not volumetric. It's a, it's a given band. So, maybe time for uh, last question. Uh, yes, uh, a comment on the uh, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. yes. interpretation of the radio data. Uh, I think that the compact jets, the flat spectral, the flat spectral uh, jets are produced by a yes, yeah, jet, yeah, so you course. cannot reduce the spectral density of complicated convolution. Yes, yes. And then you interpret the, the emission as uh, originating from the corona, that the corona is in the term of the, the maximum energy of X-ray photons or about 100 keV. Is that compatible with the uh, infrared electric electrons? You mentioned because the cutoff for the... Uh, the corona of the jet, are, even if they are getting connected with the corona. I'm not it's sure. Energy. It's not the same position. Yeah, okay, I agree with that. Uh, so, but in terms of, in, so you can also have a cutoff in the, in the high energy particle also, it depends yeah. on the acceleration and cooling time. But regarding the cutoff in X rays, uh, it was believed to be universal. But I'm not so convinced that you have a cutoff in any black, in all black holes. Because there is no systematic study of of, uh, of the cutoff for the for the power hotel in black hole. There is many sources that have no cutoff up to several hundred kV. So I would like to see. Yeah, this is correct. I would like to see uh, a systematic study of the cutoff. Uh, I mean, that integral data should be able to do that. And uh, not only energy, energy, energy. So, but there is some bright sources. I mean, so you don't see any cutoff uh, below 400 kV. So. Yeah, but in, in the hot state, you have always cut off at 100 kV. The? In the hot state, you always have cut off no, at 100 kV. No, that always. No, no. The moment you have good data, you always <coughs> have a cut off. And then what you can have a tail at any, but it's a different story. No, we have. I mean, discussion with well, Mike Novak. You may not agree. You, you are Williams. I mean. There is no... Uh, Every OSI observation with, uh, with sufficient photon statistics show a cutoff at 100 kV. Every integral data with the phot good photon statistics will tell you the same. Look at the yeah. spectrum 1118, Beposax. It's Beposax. It goes up to 100 kV and that's it. And even in Beposax you can see the cutoff. There is more, the PDS observation of too much higher energy. Yeah, but uh, so I mean, you can fit the power law there, of course, but, but you can fit also the normal thermal compensation. So every time when you have statistics, there is a cutoff. So I mean, clearly synchrotron model uh, it's, uh, and non-thermal power law, <coughs> non-thermal electrons. This is. But the cutoff is out. not a problem because you can produce cutoff with also uh, 
No, you cannot. I mean, it depends what electrons you have. Because, so there is, you have a compact jet. When, when you have a transition, you destroy the compact jet. So, like, how you destroy it? It's Rob Fender has an image of internal shocks and like that. So, I, it's not proven for the moment, but, so, you have, you destroy the compact jet, so you, then you have the superluminal ejection event. The one that's observed by Felix Mirabel in the 90s. So, these events are then decoupled from the black hole. So, these events can travel I will say incognito in the interstellar medium. And then this event will interact on a parsec scale with the interstellar medium. But then you are completely decoupled from the black hole. This has, you, what you do, you reaccelerate your particle that has been ejected, I mean, months or years before. So this has nothing to do with the black hole. So when I mentioned before for the soft state is that uh, the wind, I mean, uh, Power is the wind is equivalent to the power in the compact jet. Uh, let's continue okay. the discussion over lunch and we go on to the next two answers. Because we speak about <coughs> an extra galactic jet in state of governance resembling as Yes, I'm going to talk about bubbles <coughs> and the new uh, SS 433 object. It's not this one, as you will see, uh, but uh, another one. And, uh, well, these are some of the collaborators um, we have in Strasbourg Observatory, uh, especially the students uh, at Lise and uh, some of my collaborators. So, um, So the subject of my talk is uh, accretion and feedback into the interstellar medium, of mainly of um, ultra-luminous X-ray sources. Uh, ultra-luminous X-ray sources, which I will show, blow bubbles around them. And uh, the question is, what powers these bubbles? There is bubbles also around microquasars. You the famous example are SS433, and I will just show that shortly. And I will come to the... Uh, <coughs> Uh, to, well, SS433 and the nebula around <coughs> resembles a large supernova remnant, but it's not a supernova remnant, it's powered by, by jets, as I will show. And uh, I will, at the end, go to a new uh, SS433 object <coughs> and uh, talk about accretion and feedback. Um, so just shortly, what are X-ray, uh, what are ultraluminous X-ray sources, bright non-nuclear X-ray sources, are known already since 25 years or so. Uh, they are defined in the way that they are that the output is, is higher than the Eddington limit of a uh, stellar mass black hole, which are at the most 20 or 30 solar masses. And uh, so this is where it came about the idea of uh, intermediate mass black holes. <coughs> we have heard about that. Just an example, this is a, a XLM image of this galaxy here, and you, got, you can see there's two very, very bright sources. Uh, if you put them on, on an image, an optical image or UV image, it's like this. Just uh, to show you again, this is the X-ray image. <coughs> so, uh, <coughs> intermediate mass black holes, do they exist? Uh, in favor, often it's, uh, it's, it's given 
the, uh, that uh, the X-ray spectra often show very soft component. And if you think about <coughs> that there is a possible scaling of the inner, of the temperature of the inner deep <coughs> with the mass of the black hole, then this would, uh, the presence of a very uh, soft uh, component would uh, support uh, intermediate mass black holes. <coughs> what is the nature? really of inter, ultra luminous X-ray source with uh, what I said already, intermediate mass black holes. They could also be beamed into a line of sight, so you avoid the Eddington problem there. And uh, <coughs> what we really need from X-ray observations alone, we cannot really say, uh, to be honest. So we need, observa uh, we need information from other wavelengths. And uh, we started some years ago, optical follow-up of uh, ULXs, and this was one of the first images we got in 2000, 2001 or 2002. This was used by student uh, Laurent Merioni. And you can see here at the position of the X-ray source, this is the error circle. You see this H alpha in green uh, emitting nebula, which is quite large, 220 uh, parsec. And uh, <coughs> it's not a normal H2 region. As you can see from uh, the optical spectra, because these are dominated by very strong, well, H alpha, of course, is strong, but you have very strong S2 and oxygen 1, which tells you that this is not a normal uh, nebula, but it's either uh, shock ionized or ionized by, by X rays. <coughs> and uh, in fact, there is shock ionization, certainly, because we see uh, supersonic expansion of this kind of nebula. Here I give you another example. This is uh, <coughs> ULX 1313X2, and this is position of the X-ray source. You see this beautiful nebula, and you see these jets. No, of course not. These are not jets. This is just, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe an airplane, <laughs> <laughs> which went or uh, which went through the uh, uh, field of view at that time. But anyway, what is impressive here? is that the, the nebula is, uh, has a diameter of, of some 400 parsecs. So this is much larger than any supernova. And the expansion velocity of the nebula has been measured, can be measured, <coughs> some 100 kilometers per second. And that would give you an more enormous uh, energy content, of course. <coughs> Let's see. No. This was the one. I want to show just a very short remark to the spectra of this. This is the counterpart, and in the counterpart, this is, you see here the, the continuum of the counterpart. There's a, a nebula emission, a, a, an emission from the star, 4686 emission, and uh, that's even variable. And from that uh, observation, in principle, you can measure masses, and uh, this has not really been done yet, but we are close to that and to be able to say whether or not we have to deal here with massive black holes, intermediate mass black holes, or with uh, more stellar mass black holes. And these observations so far uh, suggest uh, low mass, well, low mass, smaller than 50 ma uh, stellar mass black holes. OK, this is another nebula, very beautiful nebula. Here, it's shock ionized as well, and this has this kind of structure like two lobes here, this is the X-ray source sitting in there. And you see there's a small uh, cluster of stars. This is the counterpart here in the, in the very, very little. And, but it's part of a small cluster of stars. Mm -hmm. Not a super cluster. Where is the second lobe? The greenish stuff? Where is the second lobe? You said two lobes. There is, yeah, this is one lobe. And this is and the, the second one. Yeah, okay. And in fact, you can see they, they are optically, they are very, very different. Here, the oxygen 3 uh, is dominating over it. So there's probably incomplete shocks seen over there. <coughs> this is the image uh, uh, my, the, the previous speaker uh, wanted to show here. This is a bubble. Um, well, first of all, let's go to SS433. It's sitting in here. And this is the nebula here, the radio nebula is uh, W50. So this is a radio image. You can see this 200 parsec. It's very large, super, well, not super, but a very large uh, uh, 
bubble also, 200 parsec. <coughs> and Stefan wants to show uh, the, the nebula around Cygnus X1, the famous one, but in bit, which is very, small, very, very small, six parsecs. <coughs> so, what powers ULX bubbles? Well, this, is, uh, this has been suggested, superpower blown by massive cluster. There is, in most cases, no, mass, no such massive cluster. <coughs> is it uh, maybe, it's a hypernodogram of the star that created the ULX, that could be, but the energy, well, there is many arguments. In fact, if you ask me later, I will explain it to you, but uh, first of all, the energy content is too high, 10 to the 53, or even more. And, uh, so I think that can be excluded. And uh, in fact, what I think they are inflated by wind or jets from the ULX. So the energ energetics, uh, you can just get from the old Weaver and our <coughs> stellar wind bubble model. And where you have uh, this is the luminosity in units of 10 to 30, uh, uh, 36 Earths per second. And you get the radius as a function of temperature, the velocity. And from that, you get, of course, immediately an age. And the age is of, of the order of 10 to the 60, 1 million years. And the luminosity is, you get from, from this, you, uh, <coughs> you will find that this depends on the radius to the square, velocity to the third, and times it, the, the density of the interstellar medium. And the density of the interstellar medium, interstellar medium you get in, prin in principle from the intensity of any recombination line in the radiative shot like an HP. And the result is that, for example, in the Cygnus X1 model, we have seen the uh, um, power of the jet is 10 to the 36 Earths per second, SS433, 10 to the 39, ULX is higher, even a factor of 10 higher, 10 to the 39 to 10 to the 40 Earths per second. Uh, in the uh, um, <coughs> luminosity in the wind or in the jets. So comparable to the X-ray output. <coughs> so, uh, well, to achieve the mechanical power of, of this order, for example, for one mega year, you can just make a calculation. This is the power, this is the uh, m dot times the, 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 the h, should be smaller than a few solar masses, of course, because you have a binary and you cannot, uh, you can only transfer during that time a few solar masses at most. And from that you get a velocity of either a jet or a wind of 30% uh, uh, already, third, or larger than 30% uh, velocity of light. And remember that SS433 has test 26% jets are at 26% of the speed of the light. But so far, it's clear, uh, I have not been able to show you any direct evidence for jets in ULX, e except for the meteorites crossing the, the image. <coughs> so the question is, are there any, when there is these big, big bubbles, maybe the bubbles, uh, the, the, uh, the bubbles around the ULX, maybe the ULX is in inactive presently, or in some of the uh, picture of ULXs, they have beamed emission and maybe they are beamed away from us. So are there any unrecognized ULXs among the large supernova remnants? And in fact, we here have here a collection of large supernova remnants in IC10. This object here, and this is a famous object I, I will come to in, in a second. And uh, <coughs> in fact, these supernova remnants is sitting in the middle, uh, or this well, supernova remnant, whatever it is. This bubble is around uh, uh, X-ray binary, a for a Faraday star plus a 30 solar mass black hole. This is the most massive black hole known. And this object here, we looked at with Chandra, and in fact, it's not a supernova remnant, but it's a ULX bubble. There's a sitting in ULX in the, in the middle of this uh, supernova remnant. Now I come to this object here. Uh, it's in, in NGC 7793 uh, at a distance of 3.4 megaparsec. You can see here there is a scale. This is the optical uh, supernova remnant discovered by Blair and Long. And uh, 
this is an H alpha. <coughs> and now I look into uh, what, what does Chandra say, uh, uh, an image of Chandra. You can see here, this is the same scale. It looks like if there is a triple source here. You know? In fact, I, I will show other images. Which is, this is, these, these are here, this is the Chandra image again, and you have here the contours, H alpha contours around uh, <coughs> H alpha contours uh, superimposed. <coughs> and uh, show another one, this is even nicer. You can see here, this is the X-ray source. The triple X-ray source, the middle one is very hard, and there is these two hot spots uh, of a, at about a distance of, of 100 parsecs. <coughs> you can compare that with the famous SS433 W50 system, which in X-rays, it's not often shown, but in X-ray, it's a, a triple source as well. If you would put SS433 away at uh, a couple of megaparsecs, it would be kind of a, <coughs> a triple X-ray source, whereas the outer sources would be kind of diffuse, but we know, of course, that the jets in SS433 are, are moving. Uh, you can compare that with uh, a radio galaxy like Cygnus A. Well, I have another image here. If it's a it would be a triple X-ray source. If it wouldn't go so deep like this Shankar low signal to noise, it would be a triple X-ray source. And look, it looks very, very similar. So, just the superposition again here of optical and X and, and the Shankar, the triple X-ray source. This is a radio image <coughs> at, uh, at uh, 20 centimeters here. Uh, this is the, uh, the supernova remnant, north thermal emission. You can see here that these are the, the uh, superposed the, the position of the X-ray source. <coughs> Again, I show you here that this is the soft band, this is the hard band. You can see the middle object is not visible in the soft band. And in fact, it has hard, very, very hard X-ray emission. It's a power of uh, 1.4. And the, the inner X-ray source, the hard, has to, of 10 to 37 F per second about. We already know the optical counterpart, which is here. It's hard, hard to see. This is, again, the X-ray source. That's uh, an image uh, from, from ESO. And there's also helium 246 x emission. But we know there's an OB star counterpart. Of the central source. Now, uh, the uh, energetics, if we do the energetics again, and, uh, we find for this object a few ten times to the 40 Earth per second in uh, mechanical luminosity. I just uh, shortly uh, <coughs> show uh, the, this image again, which has been shown just before by uh, Stefan. But note that the, the uh, Jet scene, the moving jet scene in some of the micro quasars are on a very, very small scale, 0.8 parsec, and this is 25, 250 parsec for our object. So much larger scale. Uh, radio source, well, I have to skip this, and I have to skip that too, and I come to the uh, my last slide. What have we learned? Open questions. Well, <coughs> What I want you to, to bring home uh, from this talk uh, from this talk is that ULX blow very energetic bubbles, uh, and these are likely to be uh, uh, powered by, by jets. And we have one case now where we really see the jets, like in SS433. In fact, SS433 W50 type objects are very rare. It took 30 years to find the second object. <coughs> Well, the, this bubble, NGC 7793S26, is clearly a jet inflated bubble, the system from the thermal bubble. Central source is a mass of actual binary, 10 to 37 Earths per second. And now we have two objects, SS433 and S20, S26, which show that the power, mechanical power, is much larger than the apparent X ray power. And uh, I think that, uh, well, although it's sometimes said that SS-43 is uh, ULX seen from the, from the uh, side, but we look into the, <coughs> uh, well, uh, just from the side, but uh, I think with another object, 
I think uh, this is very unlikely. Now, what we would like to know, of course, with new observations which will be carried out soon, is the connection between the microphasers and ULX on the one hand, and also about the jet interaction with the interaction of the jets with the interstellar medium or the intergalactic medium, and especially the balance between radiative and mechanical efficiency of treating uh, black holes and their uh, related feedback. Thank you very much. There are some evidences that in SS433 you have a high ultraviolet luminosity, and there are some uh, one can from some uh, features in the in this bubble you can figure out what this should be the ultraviolet luminosity to iron, uh, to make these features to like this luminosity in some lines, yes. and I think it's like 10 to 40 arcs per second uh, yes. that you need. So I mean, if you would look at this object face on, probably you still would have a very bright object. Maybe not an X-ray. There is no proof for that. But. <coughs> Yeah, well, like, like in, in, in many cases, there is two possibilities that these lines, these are optical lines, for example, uh, that they are powered by shocks or by, by uh, photoionization. And uh, it's not very, very clear whether or not uh, the one or the other mechanism dominates. And so you get a way around, possibly, uh, in, in the sense that uh, you can uh, have uh, shocks, you have, uh, ionization by shocks, for, for this case. But at least you can say that there is no, uh, th that the actual luminosity is probably not 10 to the 40 as often, often said. Maybe it's in, in the extreme ultraviolet. That is a possibility. But now we have a second case where you also have only 10 to the 37 arcs per second. Uh, makes it, well, let's say less unlikely and artificial to say uh, you hide the, the, the ionizing. So you don't believe that you has just this source is also hidden? Yeah. Well, I, I, we don't have any. We don't. Th I, I don't think so, uh, because now we have the ULXs also, and the ULXs are certainly not hidden. <coughs> okay. Any further questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sure. So it's a. Uh, you're saying it's a few solar masses injected in the jet. Yes. Yeah, so. Uh, Starting from this point, how much mass should be processed through the disk and accreted by the black hole, say, can you give an estimate? Well, you, you have about... Uh, With sort of standard efficiency. Well, you, you, maybe you have uh, Eddington for, for the ULXs, you uh, have an uh, accretion rate of 10 to, the third, uh, 10 to the minus 6 solar masses per year, times uh, 10 to the 6 years, so you would process accrete one solar mass or two, yeah. a few but, solar but masses. But you're saying in the jet you already have few solar masses. Yes, yes. In, in, well, the, in the, the X-ray is the X-ray about the same amount. Well, you have, if, you, if you do 10 to the, if, if you accrete 10 to the minus 6 solar masses a year in order to go to 10 to the 40 Earths per second. A well, sort of standard picture is that most of the mass in the accreting object is actually goes into the black hole and only a very small percentage of it is a jet in the form of relativistic jet. Well, you know, it's an order of magnitude. You can, you can play with it with a factor of 10 or so, uh, no problem. But in, in, in total, I would say, and also the models say, in 10 to the 30, in 10 to the 6 years, you accrete some 2 or 3 or so solar masses. I, th I think we can continue over lunch. Now it's lunch here, and um, no. you should not leave, leave anything in this room because it's not locked. And uh, let's thank the speakers for one second.